Chapter 15 covers enteral and parenteral nutrition support. Enteral nutrition and parenteral nutrition are artificial nutrition that can be given to patients in cases where they're not physiologically capable of meeting their calorie and nutrient needs by mouth. Enteral means involving the gastrointestinal tract. So enteral nutrition refers to two feedings that go directly into the stomach or directly into the small intestine. Enteral formulas are oral supplements that can be drank, like Boost or Ensure. Parental nutrition provides nutrition via IV, so intravenously. When it possible, it enteral nutrition is preferred over parental nutrition. Um, one reason is that enteral nutrition encourages your gallbladder to be stimulated, so you won't be at risk for gallstones. And also, prolonged parental nutrition can lead to problems with your liver, and we'll talk about that later. This is figure 15-1 on page 434 in your textbook, and this is a decision tree showing how to select a feeding route. And whether or not a person has an adequate nutrition status, and whether they have a functional G GI tract and how good their appetite is, is going to determine whether an oral diet, enteral nutrition, or parental nutrition is prescribed. Oral supplements are a type of enteral nutrition. If you drink something, it goes, it ends up in your stomach. So it's considered a type of enteral nutrition. People who have poor appetite may benefit from a an oral supplement provided that their appetite is not so poor to where they do not want to consume the oral supplement. Um, examples of oral supplements are things like Boost or um, if you ever had a one of those breakfast shakes where it's advertised as a meal replacer. So it can, uh, an oral supplement provides calories and nutrients. When considering giving a patient an oral supplement, it's important to talk to them about it first, see what they actually like. If they're, they don't like chocolate and you send them chocolate with Lucerna, they're not going to drink it. Um, it's also important that these oral supplements be ice cold. They do not taste good warm. And a lot of times they come in a metal can. So people who already have altered taste sensation um, may have a metallic taste in their mouth already. So they may associate something coming out of a metal can, um, especially if they're drinking it out of the can, um, as something uh, that they don't like or something that's going to trigger that metallic taste in their mouth. There are certain situations that warrant tube feeding. They include things like severe swallowing disorders. If somebody is having problem swallowing or they can't swallow at all, then you have we have to find another way to get nutrients to them. And in that case, a tube feed would be warranted or we would be warranted to consider a tube feed. Um, if someone has GI obstructions or fistulas, uh, fistula is an abnormal connection between two tissues that should not be there. Certain types of intestinal surgeries may require tube feeding. Um, a person with little or no appetite for extended periods of time. So a person may have swallowing disorders and may not have an appetite at all. It may be a combination of things that um, warrant a person to consider um, administering tube feeds to a patient. Other situations that warrant tube feedings, um, somebody with extremely high nutrient requirements may benefit from tube feeding. For example, a person who is undergoing a serious surgery or a person who has sustained extensive burns, somebody who's um, on a ventilator, um, somebody who's mentally incapacitated, um, certain neuro neurological disorders may prevent 
someone from meeting their nut nutritional needs by mouth or people who are in comas. There are some contraindications for tube feeding and by contraindications I mean conditions that a person may have that um, will cause you to reconsider um, the tube feeding or cause you to not want to put a patient on tube feeding. Um, intractable vomiting or diarrhea is uh, one such contraindication. Intractable means it is not well managed or it's not easily controlled. Um, also intestinal obstructions, um, that would be a contraindication. Also severe malabsorption. If somebody has a severe malabsorptive condition, then it's a contraindication for tube feeding. And that person would need instead IV nutrition. Two feeds can go through the nose, and this picture, which is in your textbook, shows transnatal, transnasal feeding tube placement. So these tubes go in through the nose, and there are three types that are shown here: nasal gastric nasal duodenal or nasal jejunal. A nasal gastric feeding tube goes in through the nose and stops in the stomach, hence the term gastric. A nasal duodenal feeding tube goes in through the nose and stops at the duodenum, as you can see in red. A nasal jejunal tube feeding goes in through the nose and stops in the jejunum and there are different situations that will warrant different um, placements. Here are enterostomies. Entero or enter in this sense, um, in this contact again means involving the um, gastrointestinal tract. Ostomy means an artificial opening. So here are two enterostomy types. There's a gastrostomy. Um, if you know what gastro means and you know what ostomy means, you can know, you'll know that that refers to an opening made into um, your stomach. So with the gastrostomy, an opening is made in your stomach into, into which um, two feeding formula is given. And Similarly, a jejunostomy is an open and made in a person's jejunum to which two feedings are administered. Whether a person is given two feedings via a transnasal route or whether it's um, an ostomy, such as a gastrostomy or jejunostomy, depends on the duration of the tube feeding. If somebody's expected to be on tube feeding for less than four weeks, generally it'll be a nasal gastric or nasal intestinal route that's chosen. Um, from my experience, honestly, um, I did not see many, if any, um, nasal gastric or nasal intestinal placements with my work with adults in hospitals. With um, my work in with children, however, um, transnasal placements were far more common. In contrast to the transnasal route, sometimes a direct route into the stomach or into the intest intestines may be warranted. For example, if the tube feeding will go longer than four weeks or if the nasal intestinal route is inaccessible for some reason. So if you look on the right, here is a picture of what is a stomach and someone's skin. So the G-tube is going through a person's skin, abdominal wall, and directly into the stomach. And tube feeding will be administered into the G-tube. This is table 15-1. It compares two feeding routes. It highlights the advantages and disadvantages of each method.
There are many different types of integral formulas. Um, in fact, in Appendix G in your textbook, um, there is a table of integral for formulas. Um, the one here on the right, um, OXIPA is one that I often use for people who were under severe metabolic stress, um, usually for people who had respiratory disorders. And there are uh, many different types of formulas um, that are directed at particular illnesses or that are developed for particular illnesses. Um, but there, the main types of formulas include standard formulas and these formulas are for patients who can digest and absorb nutrients without any difficulty. Elemental formulas, however, as the name suggests, has nutrients in them that have been broken down and these nutrients require little or no digestion. Um, so the proteins broken down, the carbohydrates broken down, and usually they will have a f type of fat, um, MCT, which stands for medium chain triglycerides. And medium chain triglycerides, if you remember from when we talked about lipids, I believe in chapter six, medium chain tri triglycerides are easily digested, very easily digested, or more easily digested than um, other types of lipids. So usually MCT oil will be in an elemental formula. The macronutrient composition of integral formulas vary. Um, it depends on the formula. If um, someone is severely malnourished and they need quite a bit of calories, then they're going to have a different macronutrient composition. The integral formula that they're prescribed is going to have a different macronutrient composition than somebody who requires an integral formula because they have difficulty swallowing or um, or unable to swallow and they don't have increased um, energy needs. Um, protein may vary from 10 to 25 percent of calories, carbohydrates from 30 to 60 percent, and fat from 10 to 45 percent. And um, I hope you know by now there are many different disease states that um, really influence the um, proportion of protein, carbohydrate, and fats that we consume or should be consuming. Generally, integral formulas will have anywhere from one to two cal calories for every milliliter of fluid. They, there are formulas with fiber and there are formulas without fiber. Um, some people may not be able to tolerate fiber because they may have um, a condition where they're not um, tolerating it. Or they may be on medication where fiber may um, bind to the medication and decrease absorption. So eh, there's a uh, different fiber context um, contents in these integral formulas. Okay, um, the here, a term that we use to describe integral formulas is osmolality. Osmolality, and it's a pretty big deal. Osmolality refers to the moles of osmotically active solutes per kilogram of water. Okay, we have our, our blood serum has an osmolality of about 300 milliosmos per kilogram of water. So, an isotonic formula contains an osmolality that is similar to blood serum, okay, 300 milliosmos per kilogram of water. A, an integral formula that is hypertonic has an osmolality greater than blood serum. So um, integral formulas can have an osmolality up to 700 milliosmos per kilogram of water. And the osmolality of a formula can influence whether a person tolerates that formula. Okay, before starting a tube feeding, it's important that healthcare practitioners 
ease the fears of the patient and the patient family members. If you're going to be putting um, a tube into somebody, either in their nose or you're doing a surgical procedure and putting a tube into their stomach or into their intestine, um, you really need to discuss this procedure with the patient and family member to make sure that they understand. Um, this is not a normal way of feeding. Um, so it's important to explain to them um, what's happening um, and the, any details um, or questions that they may ask you um, because if somebody's getting a feeding tube most of the time is their first time getting a feeding tube. Um, X-rays are used to verify the tube placement before the feeding starts. So before you start pumping liters of tube feed into somebody, you need to make sure that the tube is placed in the right place. Okay, so you need to know that what you are aiming for is um, actually where you put it. Okay, medication can be delivered via feeding tubes, okay, and before I forget to mention, um, feeding tubes or tube feedings may be given to a patient continuously, um, intermittently, or a patient may receive what's called bolus feedings. Um, for more information on that, look on page 442 of your textbook and read the section on administration of tube feedings. Um, continuous feedings mean that a person is scheduled to receive tube feedings over um, 24 hours. So 24 hours a day, tube feeding is being pumped into a person's stomach. Um, in some cases, you know, um, a person needs to be unhooked from the tube feed to go to physical therapy, and that's fine. But it's still, um, the prescription is still for a continuous feeding. If medications are to be delivered via a tube feed, which many nurses um, like the ability to deliver medications via tube feeding, um, then the tube feeding needs to be stopped prior to and after medication. Um, generally, they need to be stopped um, maybe 15 minutes before and after. Um, some medications may interact with the tube feed a metoclopramide, which is used for, um, it's used in patients who have delayed um, gastric emptying or they have um, intestinal paralysis or something that's slowing down um, their GI tract. So with metoclopramide, the recommendation is to stop tube feeding at least 30 minutes before and 30 minutes after, maybe, maybe even an hour before and an hour after, so that the medication can be absorbed fully. Um, so you really want to try to maximize absorption. That's another reason to stop the tube feeding, maximizing absorption, and also um, decreasing interactions that may occur between the medication and tube feeding. And diarrhea occurs a lot with medications and tube feedings. Medications are a major cause of diarrhea in hospitalized patients. Um, as somebody who has diarrhea who's receiving um, medications that may cause diarrhea and tube feeding, um, typically it's blamed on the tube feeding, although there are a lot of medications and medications are a major cause of diarrhea in hospitalized patients. Um, medications with uh, high osmolality, remember that term osmolality, if you forgot what it means, um, go back, either rewind this or take a look in your textbook. Um, but medications that have a high osmolality contribute to diarrhea. Also sorbitol containing medications, sorbitol is a sugar alcohol that's not fully digested in your GI tract and it can lead to diarrhea. Um, laxatives and antibiotics um, often lead to diarrhea. Um, if somebody is receiving a tube feeding that is hypertonic, 
meaning that it has um, a it has a um, high osmolality then that can contribute to diarrhea and sometimes the tube feeding can be changed to something that is um, closer to your blood serum osmolality or closer to that 300 milliosmos per kilogram of water um, there are a number of complications that can occur with tube feeding um, many complications are preventable however by making appropriate selections with regard to the feeding route with regard to formula and how that tube feeding is going to be delivered at some point hopefully ideally a person will um, be transitioned on to table foods and this decision is made um, ideally it's made by a um, interdisciplinary team of healthcare professionals um, but the transition of table feeding is going to depend on a patient's medical condition and the type of feeding that a patient is receiving so if a person's medical condition is improving then they can be start to be weaned off of that tube feeding and they can be they can start consuming an oral diet so a person who hasn't been receiving a tray from the kitchen or hasn't re hasn't been receiving their breakfast lunch and dinner from the kitchen can start to receive some food from the kitchen not a whole lot of food at first but um, they can again start eating um, so you want to make that transition as smooth as possible you want to make sure that before you remove somebody from enteral nutrition that they're actually tolerating um, table foods the other type of artificial nutrition that we're going to discuss is parental nutrition parental nutrition is IV nutrition IV nutrition can be administered via a peripheral vein or via a central vein um, and there are a lot of conditions warranting parental nutrition um, generally um, as you saw earlier and as I mentioned earlier uh, when we were talking when with the slide of the decision tree um, we talked about how decisions are made regarding whether someone can you know have an oral diet or and it should be put on enteral feedings or parental feeds but um, if somebody with intestinal obstructions or fistulas um, they would actually warrant um, parental nutrition even if they have a good appetite um, someone with intestinal paralysis somebody with short bowel syndrome short bowel syndrome just means that somebody has a substantial portion of the small intestine that has been taken out and people with intractable vomiting or diarrhea intractable means some it's not easily controlled or it's not easily managed those persons would constitute the people that you would want to um, consider putting on parental nutrition versus interim nutrition here's a chart from your book that shows an obvious solution going into a central line meaning a central vein and in this case it's going in through the superior vena cava the parental solution itself is often prepared by a pharmacy and pharmacies um, hospitals have pharmacies some pharmacies some hospitals um, outsource their pharmacies it depends on you know the size of the facility etc um, the solutions are generally customized and generally the registered dietitian will write the prescription for the parental nutrition um, the solution should be customized to maximize um, outcomes or optimize health outcomes um, but a lot of t there's um Pfizer or Baxter started making um, Clinimix which is a pre-mixed parental IV solution and it's convenient and a lot of people 
use it. Um, I think they use it more so than they should. I think that, you know, if you're going to be putting um, dextrose and um, amino acids and lipids into somebody's veins, then you really need to take a close look at how many calories they're getting, how much fluid they're getting, etc. So uh, instead of arbitrarily writing an order for Clinimix, um, 50 milliliters per hour, um, you should have a dietitian look into um, that patient's energy needs and fluid needs and determine the correct proportion of nutrients that person should have, including any vitamins and minerals or insulin or what have you that um, that person may need while on that um, parenteral nutrition. Okay, so let's talk about um, amino acids in a parental nutrition solution. The um, amino acids, when they're given in a parental nutrition solution, they contain all non-essential amino acids. The concentration of amino acids that can be ordered um, can range from 3.5% amino acids up to 20% amino acids. Okay, and there was a question in your case study um, that asks you to calculate the macronutrient and energy content of a parenteral solution um, and they gave you um, the percentage and etc. But anyway, um, there's an example of how to calculate the macronutrient and energy content of a solution on page 452. So if I lose you here, um, you might want to follow along on page 452. Um, a 5% amino acid solution will contain 5 grams of amino acids for every 100 milliliters of solution. Okay, so if a 5% amino acid has 5 grams of amino acids for every 100 milliliters of solution, how much is in 1,000 milliliters of solution? 1,000 milliliters, of course, is equal to 1 liter. And that answer would be 50 grams. Um, similarly, a 10% amino acid has 10 grams of amino acid for every 100 milliliters of solution. So it would contain 100 grams of amino acids for every liter. Um, so back to our example, we have a 5% amino acid solution. Um, and that translates into 50 grams of amino acids for every liter. How many calories um, would be provided from protein in that one liter of solution? Well, we know that there's four calories for every gram of amino acid, so 50 times four would equal 200 calories. So in that one liter, 200 calories are from amino acids. As far as carbohydrates go in a parental nutrition solution, um, the main source of energy um, is glucose, which is provided by dextrose monohydrate. In a dextrose monohydrate solution, um, each glucose molecule is associated with a single water molecule. And um, know that dextrose monohydrate actually provides fewer calories per gram than carbohydrate. Okay, so carbohydrate from dextrose monohydrate actually provides 3.4 calories per gram. So whenever you're trying to calculate the number of um, calories uh, in a parental nutrition solution, um, you have to consider that 3.4 calories um, per gram is used instead of 4 calories per gram because of the form that glucose is found in. Lipid emulsions supply essential fatty acids and they are also a significant source of energy. Um, Typically, lipid emulsions are given once a week um, in the hospital. Um, that was usually how I did it. Um, and there are different 
percent lipid lipid emulsions okay so there are different concentrations of lipid emulsions there's 10 percent 20 percent and 30 percent and um, respectively they correspond to 1.1 2 and 3 calories per milliliter of lipid emulsion in determining fluids and electrolytes um, or with regard to fluids and electrolytes a patient's fluids need, fluid needs need to be adjusted according to a hydration assessment and also daily fluid losses also if there is some type of physiological condition like the person has kidney problems um, then fluid needs need, may need to be decreased to I mentioned this earlier but an in-depth look at how to calculate macronutrient and energy content of a parental, parental solution is found on page 452 if you are interested in doing the case study for bonus points um, I will not ask you to calculate um, or I will not grade you on your ability or test you on your ability to calculate macronutrient and energy content of a parental solution. I will not test you on that. When dealing with parental nutrition, you have to consider the osmolarity of the solution um, as opposed to osmolality. Osmolality what we use with reference to enteral nutrition and osmolarity we're using with reference to parental nutrition. Um, TPN solutions or total parental nutrition, total parental nutrition goes into a central vein. So TPN solutions, those that go into a central vein may be as nutrient dense as needed. Um, the components that contribute to the osmolarity of a parental nutrition solution include um, the amount of amino acids, the amount of dextrose, and the electrolytes in it. These three contribute to osmolarity. Lipids do not contribute to osmolarity. In the administration of parental nutrition, it takes a, an interdisciplinary team. Um, the phys physician, <coughs> nurse, dietitian, and pharmacist are involved, um, all involved with um, some aspect of administration of parental nutrition to a patient. Okay, whenever it's time to take someone off of um, parental nutrition or discontinue the IV infusion, the patient must have an adequate GI function. Why must they have an adequate GI function? Because if you're taking them off of um, an IV infusion, which is used as their sole source nutrition, then they're going to need to be able to digest and absorb foods that are eaten by mouth. If someone has a suppressed appetite, then the transition from IV nutrition to an oral diet may be difficult or may be um, prolonged. Okay, and there are always risks involved, huh? Well, parental nutrition isn't any different. There are several metabolic complications that can occur with parental, um, parental nutrition. Um, one complication is hypertriglyceridemia. What is that, you ask? Hypertriglyceridemia refers to a high level of uh, triglycerides in the bloodstream. Hyper, of course, means... Um, too much triglyceride refers to a triglyceride and emia refers to um, the bloodstream. Um, so if someone gets hypertriglyceridemia, if they're receiving lipid um, infusions, then you need to reduce the lipid infusion or stop it altogether. Refeeding syndrome. This syndrome um, is characterized by electrolyte and fluid imbalances and also hyperglycemia and Refeeding syndrome occurs in people who are severely malnourished or who have been fasted for several days and consume 
um, start consuming food, but consume more food than their body is able to handle at that time. So people with refeeding syndrome have to be um, introduced to calories, nutrition, however, if it's by mouth, if it's by enteral feeding or parenteral feeding, people who are at risk for refeeding syndrome need to be started back on um, their nutrient source gradually so they will not suffer electrolyte and fluid imbalances and um, hyperglycemia. Other metabolic complications include hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia. Liver disease is a complication that can occur with um, IV infusion or parental nutrition. In order to minimize the risk, it's important to avoid giving too much energy, too much dextrose, or too many lipids. Um, lipids in excess can will promote fat deposition in the liver. Long term use of parental nutrition can actually result in progressive liver disease and may eventually lead to liver failure. So it's very important to minimize risk. If it is appropriate, if the patient can tolerate it, um, oral feedings may be encouraged in order to reduce the amount of parental support that is actually needed. So if a patient can tolerate some oral, some foods orally, um, then that means that we can decrease the amount of um, TPN we're giving them or parental um, solution we're giving them. Gallbladder disease can result. Why does gallbladder disease result? Well, when parental nutrition continues for generally a um, period of more than four weeks, what happens is sludge in the form of thickened bile, remember that the gallbladder stores bile, um, a sludge can develop, build up, and eventually lead to gallstone formation. So you can get gallstones if you are on um, parental nutrition for an extended period of time due to um, sludge in the form of thickened bile um, builds up in the gallbladder. So people who require long-term parental nutrition may be given preventive medica medications uh, or oral feedings can be initiated before this problem occurs. Um, the medications that are given um, are used to stimulate the gallbladder and by stimulating the gallbladder to contract, this can decrease the chances of um, that thick bile sludge from forming. Um, and the last metabolic complication that I'm going to mention is metabolic bone disease. And this is a complication of long-term parental nutrition use. Uh, this is associated with a reduced bone mineralization and low bone density, and that may be due to um, differences or abnormalities in the way that your body is processing or metabolizing calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, and sodium. Also inappropriate intakes of vitamin D, vitamin K, or phosphorus may also contribute to metabolic bone disease. May um, Ideally what you want is um, is to not keep a person on parental nutrition any longer than they need to be. Take a look at the case study in your book um, about the patient with intestinal disease requiring parental nutrition. That's on the bottom of page 455. And again, that's the bonus, the bonus. In some cases, nutrition support at home may be warranted. However, you need to be a good candidate for home nutrition support. Um, individuals who actually are referred to um, are individuals who are advised to have home nutrition support of those who um, generally have disorders that may prevent food from reaching the intestines or they're going to be on 
um, nutrition support for a long period of time. So a person can receive either enteral nutrition at home or parental nutrition. Um, so if somebody has a disorder and it's severely impeding nutrient absorption or interfering with intestinal motility, um, nutrition support or parental nutrition support may be warranted at home. There are some decisions required when planning to send someone home with nutrition support. The access site needs to be decided, the type of formula that's going to be used needs to be decided, and the nutrient delivery method used to be, is, needs to be decided. Um, ideally, um, the patient will, needs to be involved in making these decisions. Um, the patient needs to um, understand why they need home nutrition support. They need to understand how to correctly administer their nutrition care um, if they're going to be doing it themselves as with the case with um, gastrostomies. Um, some people can generally catch on to that and start doing it themselves. Um, so if you are on long-term parenteral nutrition or enteral nutrition um, and it's required you to go home that way because you're going to be on it for a long time, then it may start to affect your life. Um, some quality of life issues that are noteworthy include lifestyle, sitting for an extended period of time to receive um, a continuous tube feed is time consuming and inconvenient. Um, some people will go home with a tube feed and they will be hooked to a machine at night and they will only receive their tube feeding over an eight to ten hour span so their waking hours can be spent doing other things like working a job for example um, but one of the most common complaints about what's and that's called nocturnal feeding um, is a sleep disturbance also, the economic impact has to be considered. Um, some insurances don't cover tube feeds. Some tube insurances um, believe that tube feeds are food and so they won't cover it. Um, there are social issues like social isolation. You're not going out to eat with your family. You're not sitting at the table. Um, things like that. There is a foundation called the Ollie Foundation and it's a source of support and information for people who do require um, home nutrition so um, if you're curious about it then check it out but that's all I have you for you for chapter 15 if you have any questions at all about any of this material uh, let me know send me an email